Hello everyone, I'm Jason Weintraub, the Entomology Collection Manager here at the Academy. Welcome to the Entomology Department. Today I'm going to be showing you some examples of the amazing insects that are housed in our research collection. The collection includes approximately four million insects from all over the world, every continent except Antarctica. And it dates back to before the founding of the Academy in 1812. So this is the oldest insect collection in the country. The Academy's entomology collection is remarkable and unique in that we have the world's largest collection of orthopteroid insects. The orthoptera include grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, and their relatives. We'll take a look at some examples of the grasshopper collection to give you an idea of how these are preserved. The insects in our collection are housed in tightly sealed steel cabinets and then within those cabinets we have them in columns of what we call insect drawers, uh, wooden cases that are glass topped so we can see what's in them. And grasshoppers in our collection are preserved simply by drying them. Uh, this is a drawer of Titanacris grasshoppers, a magnificent group that occur in Central and South America. And this is fairly typical of how most insects in our collection are organized. Within each of these cases, we'll have a tray for each species, or in some cases, multiple trays for a species. And dried specimens are mounted on special pins, archival pins, and the pins serve as an anchor point for all of the scientific data associated with each grasshopper. So if you look closely um, at the grasshoppers in this case, you can see that underneath each specimen, there are a series of paper tags or labels. The brightly colored hindwings of these grasshoppers, which are only visible when they're flying, are an example of warning coloration. Visual predators like birds and lizards learn to avoid certain colors as warning signs that an insect is inedible, poisonous, or distasteful. And many grasshopper species sequester poisonous compounds from their plant, plants that they're feeding on and use those for chemical defense. And there are other species that are perfectly palatable but gain protection through mimicry by having bright red or magenta coloration. The Academy's Lepidoptera collection includes moths and butterflies from all over the world. Some of the largest and most spectacular Lepidoptera belong to the wild silk moth family. The atlas moth, Atticus atlas, is found in tropical Asia, Southeast Asia. The atlas moths are quite remarkable in that they have areas of wing membrane that are completely devoid of scales. You can see these areas that look almost transparent. And there are a number of different moths and butterflies that have transparent wings like this. These types of windows in the wings often serve to break up the outline of the wings and make it harder for predators to figure out that they're looking at something they might want to eat. And the other interesting adaptation that atlas moths have are these remarkable patterns on the hooked tips of their forewings that look almost like the head of a snake. If you can imagine a cobra rearing up and that false eye spot in the sort of snake head part of its wing. Not surprisingly, these are moths that occur in areas where cobras are not uncommon. So visual predators like birds and lizards might think twice about attacking something that might be a snake. Another tropical member of the wild silk moth family is the comet moth, Argema mitteri, which occurs only on the island of Madagascar. And like a number of uh, moths in this family, these have these remarkably long tail-like projections from their hind wings. And until quite recently, it was thought that 
These might be some sort of decoy for visual predators to help moths escape. If a bird attacked them and broke off the tip of the tail, it could fly away. But it turns out that they're actually an anti-predator de defense for nocturnal predators. The function of these tails as a defense mechanism was only recently studied experimentally using our North American Luna moth, which also has long tails. And these are a device that jams the sonar of bats and confuses the sonar of bats. They sh shouldn't say jams the sonar of bats, but it creates a false sonar image. So when a bat is chasing these, the tails trail behind the body of the moth in the air and create a false image of the moth's body. So the bats are diving at the end of the tails instead of at the body of the moth, and they miss them. Some of our local wild silk moth species, like the Io moth, have false eye spots on their hind wings that are covered when the moths are at rest. And if these moths are startled by a predator, they'll move their forewings upward suddenly to reveal these striking eye-like patterns. And that's another defense mechanism that these silk moths often have against vis visual predators. You can see some dried skins of the caterpillars of these species. This is kind of an archaic way of preserving um, immature stages. We don't normally do that anymore, but back in, in the uh, early days of the academy, it was a popular way to preserve and display larvae of moths and butterflies. And the eel moth is one of our wild silk moths that's of medical importance because its larvae are covered with rows of uh, spines that can inject a venom into humans if you brush against them and the tips of the spines break your skin. Um, you can be envenomated by these. And it can land you in the hospital if you have a, a reaction to the venom. Our largest North American insect is a wild silk moth species that is not uncommon in, in the Philadelphia area. This is Citheronia regalis, the regal moth or royal moth. And a large female of this species, these, this is a female down here, can have a, a wingspan of nearly nine inches. And the larva of this moth is commonly known as the hickory horned devil and is the largest caterpillar you're likely to encounter in our area. Unlike the majority of wild silk moth species, these actually don't spin a cocoon um, to overwinter. Caterpillars burrow into the soil and they'll form a pupa, like this dried pupa here, about six inches under the surface. These storage cabinets house the entomology type collection. Um, in biological collections, type specimens are often segregated from the main collection, and these are scientifically the most important and valuable part of our insect collection. When a scientist names a new species of plant or animal, they designate an actual sample as the type specimen of that species, and it becomes a physical link to the name of that organism in biological nomenclature. So these are the definitive reference specimens for confirming identifications. And we keep the type collection separate and store them a little bit differently from the main collection. The type of each species has its own separate tray. And these are wild bee species in the same family as the honeybee. Uh, in most cases, they'll just be a single type specimen. And you see many of these trays have just one pinned bee specimen. In the old days, it was commonplace to designate multiple types for the same species, a practice that isn't allowed anymore. So some of the oldest of our uh, specimens in the type collection will often be sometimes two or even um, here three syntypes. And these are the, the definitive samples that one must study to be able to confirm the identity of a specimen that one has, to 
describe a new species, you often have to compare it with types of close relatives to make sure that it is, in fact, di different, morphologically distinct. Beetles, the insect order Coleoptera, are the most diverse group of living things on our planet. And they range in size from tiny species the size of a pinhead to among the largest, heaviest insects, such as these goliath beetles, large scarab beetles native to tropical Africa. Beetles have a really remarkable adaptation that has served them well during the course of their evolution. They have four wings that became modified into these hard coverings that we call elytra and they only use their second pair of wings, the hind wings, for flight. And this was a key evolutionary innovation in that they're able to fold their hind wings like an accordion, protect them underneath the hardened elytra and crawl into crevices, nooks and crannies, hollow logs without risking damaging the wings or getting them snagged. There are more different species of beetles than any other group of living things. Um, we've formally named, scientists have formally named about 450,000 species of Coleoptera, but we think that there are many, many more undescribed beetle species, possibly millions. Based on the statistics we've compiled with what we know about uh, named living organisms, if you took one example of every named living thing, every plant, animal, fungus, bacterium, you line them up side by side, one out of every five would be a beetle. So this one insect group represents 20% of known life on our planet. The most dangerous insects in our collection, at least as far as humans are concerned, are small flies that you're all familiar with. These are the family Culicidae, mosquitoes. And many of them are of great importance to human welfare because they are disease vectors. And this is a tray of the Asian tiger mosquito, Stegomyia albopictus, formerly Aedes albopictus. And this is an example of an invasive species that was native originally to tropical and subtropical Asia and was introduced to North America in the late 20th century in the 1980s. And these were accidentally brought in as live eggs and larvae in imported used tires from Japan that were brought to Texas. The mosquitoes became established in Texas and they spread throughout the southern part of North America and as far north as southern New England. And we documented the presence of this species in here in Philadelphia, you can see a series of specimens, recent specimens with computer printed labels from late 20th century when they first appeared here. All of the older specimens were collected in the Philippines during World, World War II and the middle 20th century. And this is an example of another reason that collections like the academies are important. They enable us to document changes in the geographic distribution of insects that are important to our welfare. Aedes albopictus or Stegomyia albopictus is an important vector of dengue fever and of the Zika virus, which has been in the news a lot. And these are mosquitoes that we need to worry about controlling and we need to avoid being bitten by them if we don't want to get sick. Medical entomologists use collections like this mosquito collection both to confirm the identification of species that are important disease vectors and to study changes in their geographic distribution over time.